Agents, we are armed! What would you do if we do all the you things we know? Would you stand up for truth? Or would you turn away to? And then what if you saw all of the things that's wrong? Would you stand tall and strong? Or would you turn and walk away? What would you do if you knew all the things we know? Would you stand up for truth? Or would you turn away too? And then what if you saw all of the things that's wrong? Would you stand tall and strong? Or would you turn and walk away? I see a message from the government. Like every day, I'll watch and listen. So these maps show you the uh, progression of land transfer in this area over the past 60 or so years. The green areas are Palestinian land. The white areas at the beginning are land purchased by Jewish immigrants who are coming over from Europe, either because they wish to create a Jewish state or because they had nowhere else to go. Uh, there were a lot of refugees, of course, from the Holocaust, from the Nazi Holocaust. Um, this in contrast to the Jewish Palestinians, many of whom uh, were not Zionists. They had been living there with Muslims and Christians, and they were working towards a Palestinian state, like their neighbors and friends. Um, anyway, so the Zionist uh, movement had about 8% in 1946. Then in 1947, after tremendous persecution, of course, of Jewish people in Europe, the UN proposed to give 54% of this area in the Middle East to the Jewish people so that they could create a Jewish state. Uh, these white areas in the second map there. And that left Palestinian Christians with about 46% of the land in the area. Christians and Muslims, excuse me. Um, so imagine you're a Palestinian and you are being offered about half of what was already your land. <laughs> they didn't think this was terribly generous on the part of the UN to offer them half of their land, basically to take away half of their land. And likewise, Zionist forces had a big problem. Yes, they were happy about partition. They had lobbied for it in the United Nations uh, successfully. That was a big gain from 8 to 54 percent. But they had a major problem. And that is that they wanted to create a Jewish state. This was their, their dream, their vision, understandably, given what they had been through. They wanted to create a Jewish state. But there were all of these non-Jews who were living there. The, the majority of the people who were living on the land where they wished to create a Jewish state simply weren't Jewish. They were Muslim and they were Christian. And you can't have a Jewish state with a non-Jewish majority. And so Zionist forces proceeded to expel the majority of the non-Jewish population from the land in what became known to uh, Israelis as the War of Independence and to Palestinians as al-Nakba, which means in Arabic, the catastrophe, in which the majority of the Christian and Muslim population were oftentimes violently expelled from their homes and lands in an effort to, in the words of Zionist leaders, cleanse the area of the, this other culture and religion in order to be able to fulfill the vision of a Jewish state. Um, the, the, the people surviving from this um, from, from this ethnic cleansing, let's call it what it is, that people were being pushed out because of their ethnicity and their religion. This was the reason for them having to leave. Um, there were more than 500 Palestinian villages, let me go back here, more than 500 Palestinian villages within these areas. They, the Zionist forces went beyond 54% into 78%. So imagine 500 or so villages here, um, completely raised and depopulated. And those villages are still there, many of them covered up with trees today. And the, uh, the refugees of those areas, which in 1948 were about 750,000, today number uh, more than 7 million. And they're scattered around the world. We might even have any here today. No, not, not tonight. Um, they're all over, I'm sure there are some here in Racine, many I've met so far in Wisconsin, many of them are in uh, Lebanon and Syria and Jordan and Egypt and really all around the world. And they are not allowed to go back to their villages, their homes and their lands. I just recently went on a trip through Syria and Lebanon and uh, Jordan where I met a lot of these refugees, um, many of whom still carry around the papers um, to their homes, to their, their land, their land deeds, their land titles showing, you know, I, 
I never sold my land. This is my land. I own it. I was pushed off it. I have the right, and they do, according to international law, to go back to my homes, to leave, to leave these slums, to leave these refugee camps. Um, and they're not allowed to by Israel, although they are supposed to have that right. So anyway, carrying those around, proving, you know, this is not a farce. A lot of them still have the keys to their homes that they were forced out of, you know. As they were fleeing, they hurriedly locked their doors and ran away expecting they would be back, you know, to, to, to their homes in a week or two. And now, 61 years later, they have never been allowed to return. And they are not allowed to go to these homes and these lands. Um, but I can. I'm Jewish. I could get Israeli citizenship. Uh, and I could go to his land. He's a Nakba survivor. I could go to his land um, that he was born in, that he remembers, that he lived in. Um, I could go to his land, and I could buy his land, and I could uh, farm his land, and I could build a house on his land. And if his house is still there, I could live in his house on his land. He can't even visit because he's not Jewish. And you know, we hear a lot about the, the, the Jewish state's right of existence, and, and it seems very understandable, given what Jews have been through, that they would want to have a state that was their own. But what does it mean if the existence of a Jewish state requires discriminating against Christians and Muslims? Does that change anything? Does that change that right? You know, is there a right for a place that, that replaces another population, for a diaspora to come and create a new diaspora, for a people who've been religiously and culturally expelled to then expel another religion and culture from a land? Is there a right for that? Do two rights make do two wrongs make a right? Um, anyway, so uh, so the irony that I can now go back to these lands. And they who are so welcoming and hospitable to me cannot is something uh, haunting, I think. It's something uh, embarrassing, I think, for, for our actions and something we should be aware of. Um, here, for example, is one of those villages um, back in the 1930s, one of that more than 500 villages. And if you go back there today, this is what you would find. It's been planted over with trees. That's the case with the majority of those villages. Um, we hear a lot about, well, Palestinian refugees came back, then all of the inhabitants of their homes, the Israelis, they would become refugees too. We don't hear that the vast majority of the villages that were depopulated were not then re-inhabited by Israelis, but actually systematically covered up with trees. In fact, I personally grew up putting my quarters in these little tin cans. Uh, it said Jewish National Fund, plant a tree in Israel. I thought it was this great environmental thing, you know, <coughs> my quarters in there. I didn't realize that these quarters were going towards covering up the existence of a Christian and Muslim population in the area. And although I can go to these areas, like I said, most refugees can't, there's one little loophole. There's a little loophole to this. And that is that, um, let me go back here, and that is that, uh, the Palestinians, the way that their movement is controlled, those who are in the West Bank and Gaza, the way their movement is controlled is through their ID cards, their hawiyas. And with that, the military is able to control who can go where. Now, Palestinians get their hawiyas when they're about 15 or 16 years old, which means that before they're 15 or 16, they actually have a little bit of leeway in how much they can move around, but they're not usually going to take advantage because they're 13 and they're not going through you know, military checkpoints without their parents by themselves. So a couple of my colleagues actually have started to accompany these young people on a journey that they would otherwise never be able to take as soon as they turn 16 um, to, to three places that they would otherwise never be able to go to. And those three places um, are Jerusalem, the sea, and their destroyed villages. And along the way, they're given cameras with which they can document their experiences. And I'd like to show you some of their own photographs as well as read some of their captions as they go on this journey. The first day being to Jerusalem. This is Jerusalem, a very beautiful city. I love Jerusalem, and I had a lot of fun wandering around the city. I love Jerusalem because it's a holy city, and I would love to visit it always. These are kids who will probably, even if they live 10 miles away, never be able to go 
to Jerusalem again because they're not Jewish. Uh, this is um, when they go to the sea. It says, when I saw the sea, I loved it because it was very beautiful. This picture is very beautiful. And um, this is one of my favorite pictures. I'm from California. You here living in Racine. You know this is not a particularly glamorous shot of, of a sea, right, of, of the water. What it reminds us of is how exciting it is to go to the sea for the first time. I mean, if you can imagine these kids, they, can wa they watch the sunset over the sea every night from their rooftops. They're 20, 15, 20 miles away from it. But they can't go to the sea, and they can't touch it, and they can't swim in it, and they can't taste it, and they can't smell it because of their religion. And the excitement of, of pulling up in that bus, and they're, they're screaming, they run out, they run straight into the water, even if they haven't changed, or it's raining, or it's cloudy, or whatever, and how, how exciting that is for them. And they play at the beach. And then they go to their villages. This one says, in this picture you can see the old mosque of Yazur. The Zionists took over after the 1948 Nakba. The mosque was turned into a synagogue. Our ancestors used to pray there when it was a mosque. This mosque was the biggest in Yazur in 1948. After 1948, all Palestinians were forced to leave and no Palestinians were allowed to enter the city again. Um, getting to their villages is tough. You know, they're not on any uh, modern maps. There aren't any upkept roads uh, to, uh, to get to them. And so they're sort of comparing these old photographs with the hillsides. Once they get there, they're exploring. They're climbing trees and climbing <coughs> caves and maybe picking some spices. Even once they get there, they don't know where to go. They've never been there. They've dreamed of it, but they've, they've never actually um, been to their own villages, um, and so what they'll end up doing is they'll call their grandparents, the grandparents who remember the village oftentimes very, very vividly, they'll call them 15, 20 miles away, and their grandparents will guide them on this journey through their own village. You know, uh, go, go down into the valley, turn right at the pomegranate tree there on your left, that's, uh, that's your uncle's house, that on the right, that's your house, you know, guiding them on this village. Um, from all that they remember. Here are some of the self-portraits taken by the kids. And again, when we talk about a Jewish state and the Jewish majority, um, these are the faces that are forgotten. That that Jewish majority means but the seven million, like these kids here, can never go back to their lands. Uh, this is Ta'er, who found his grandpa's orange tree. He's excited to eat his own olives. I'm uh, sorry, his own uh, oranges. I meant to say orange tree, I didn't. And then they go back. They go back to basically the prison that they are in, in their refugee camps in the West Bank. Um, and what's happening with the occupation is similar to what has happened in Safuria and, and with those other villages, and that is this sort of gradual, gradual covering up of the non-Jewish population, the history, the future, in, even in, in the occupied areas, the West Bank and Gaza. And, um, and when we see this, we should again think, you know, have we seen this before? You know, can you think of another place where you could have four similar maps of the indigenous population? Of course, absolutely. Uh, the most important one to us should be what's happening right here in the United States. This doesn't even begin at the, at the beginning, but rather about halfway through. But the way that indigenous populations have been squeezed onto smaller and smaller um, islands, reservations we call them. Can you think of another historic parallel? Africa. South Africa is the big one people bring up. Um, there are also the black South African population was ghettoized into smaller and smaller ghettos. Here they were called Bandustans. In the U.S. they were, they were called uh, reservations. Uh, so, uh, uh, here actually they were even called homelands. They had another nice euphemism uh, for them. 
Um, anyway, uh, this, uh, the same process basically. And when we look back on this, and everyone agrees that was wrong, you know, and we look back on what happened to Native Americans, and although we might not know how to reconcile our presence here with this history, we at least acknowledge what happened to them was wrong. And we probably think, well, if we'd been around, we would have spoken up. This was wrong. People shouldn't be pushed off their lands. Genocide, as happened to Native Americans, we would have been the kind of people who spoke out. Well, this is happening right now. It's happening right now. It's, a, it's, four, it's four maps, but there's going to be a fifth and a sixth. Mm -hmm. And it's going to continue. We have power to affect change in this issue, and we need to do, we need to, to do that, you know? Um, if, if people see these things and are simply sympathetic, it doesn't, it doesn't really help all that much, to be honest. I think it's appropriate to be sympathetic, um, but it's not what changes things, and it's really not what Palestinians need or, or want. They have plenty of sympathy. It's almost degrading the way everyone takes pity on them, but isn't necessarily willing to be one of those people who steps out of their comfort zone to make change. So if we are one of those people um, who is the kind who actually spoke out, um, what are some things that we can do to affect change on this issue, or maybe some things that people are already doing on this issue. You get speakers like Anna <laughs> <laughs> you, can get, you can get education, you can get speakers. I know we have a, a public speaker right here. You want to introduce yourself? Well, I'm a recent friend of Anna Balser, very proud to be a friend. I'm Bob Ashmore. And some of you have heard me speak in the area here. Uh, I've been a professor at Marquette University for a long time and uh, have uh, um, been to Israel, Palestine, and in fact taught in Gaza. So, but she does a wonderful job, doesn't she? Yeah. Well, so, so, so just to say, you know, we, there are people here in your community who have extensive experience. I just had dinner with him and he has more, more experiences than I could ever have, especially in the short time I've been doing this. Are there other people here who've yeah. even been to Palestine? Yeah, Jeffrey Lane. Yeah, so here you, have, here you have experts, and I don't know if you've already done talks, but you have people in your community who can help to educate you on this issue, and you can continue to educate yourselves through the resources I've provided and your, <laughs> your, own, um, and your own research. So yes, educational things, educating ourselves and others. And I thank the people who made this actually happen tonight. Thank them uh, gratefully. Other ideas for getting involved. And Anna, Amy yeah. Lane right here was in Palestine in December. Yes. Uh, October? Uh, yeah, October, November. Oh, with the hours. In fact, that's a way to get involved. Yes. <laughs> Going to Palestine, if that's an option for you. I mean, did it change your life or did it change your life? Oh, yeah. <laughs> it changed our lives. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's an extraordinary experience. If it's a possibility for you, um, I'm sure those people who have been to Palestine would be happy to talk to you about it, what it did for them, and also ways that other people can go on your handouts. There are also ideas um, for places, but ways that you can actually go to Palestine, either to, to be a witness and to go and decide for yourself and see what's happening, or if you're at a point when you want to actually work in solidarity, there are solidarity groups like the one I work with, human rights groups, that you can work with as well. So, so definitely that's an, that's an option for many um, and, and one people can consider. And Elaine on Friday is going to be meeting with Congressman Sensenbrenner to talk oh, wow. about some of these issues. Oh, so is Bob Ashmore. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I have work cut out for you, Elaine. Um, so there's another one, right? Contacting our, represent our representatives, absolutely. Um, how many people here have written letters to their representatives before? All right. How did you feel after that experience of writing a letter? I emailed okay. um, Washington. They wanted feedback of what can change what okay. my suggestions. Okay. <laughs> and when I wrote about the situation, they wrote something back like, this isn't what they were talking about. <laughs> Has anyone else had that experience? <laughs> yes. <laughs> right? As soon as they see Israel, they think, oh, this must be someone supporting Israel, and we'll give them the form letter back that talks about how we will never abandon 
um, our unconditional support, blah, 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 <laughs> having nothing to do with what we wrote. I find, personally, I find writing letters very disempowering as opposed to empowering. It doesn't make me feel like I have a voice at all. And I think that what that what what's happening there is not that there is no use in contacting our officials. After all, those who are writing to support Israel, the majority of the people they get letters from on this issue have been very influential. This is a method that can be very influential. So why aren't we having the influence that that opposition or that other side is having? And I think the answer is organization, yeah. frankly. Um, did you want to mention well, something? Yeah, a, I think you have to have an organization, um, get a, a delegation from various organizations, a coalition, do your homework, get together, know who's going to be the speaker, what exactly, and, and it's, especially when there's something hot in Congress, yes. when the issue of the settlements is, is on, on the front burner. And then meet if you're lucky with your with your representative, you might get the um, the, the staff person who's responsible. But they do report. But I, I, I you know, I feel so much, I do it. I do the email. Yes. But I, I don't. Not a lot of so first of all, this is great advice, by the way. If you are going in there, be prepared. There are actually toolkits for activists. One of them is, is, is listed as a link or a phone number you can call to get it sent to you, uh, sort of a, a, to, a checklist, a to-do list before you go in and talk to a representative, as well as before you organize a demonstration, do a town hall meeting, organize an event. It's just kind of a regular toolkit. It doesn't cost anything if you get it on the online. Um, so yes, do be prepared and, and get advice if it's from the toolkit or from others on, on how to do that. Um, but still, you know, whether or not you, you write a letter efficient, you write a letter well or you express your opinions well to the staff person um, doesn't necessarily mean that anything's going to come from it. And, and again, I do believe that the issue at this point is organization. I think it may have in the past been that we were too small that public opinion simply did not favor Palestinian equal rights, that there were not enough people who cared about this issue to make a dent. I believe that that's changed. I believe that's changed if you actually look, hold on, if you actually look at uh, public opinion polls on, on the way that the U.S. feels about uh, Middle East foreign, U.S. foreign policy, um, if you look at the number of people working on this issue versus how big the actual APAC and, and the other parts of the Zionist lobby are, we are actually more numerous. Than, than they are. Um, and I believe with our resources pooled and our energies pooled, we could have a lot of money. We are just missing the organization <coughs> point. We are fragmented, we are working here and there and everywhere passionately, and we should keep doing it. But we've all got to do at least one thing in common so that our voices are resounding as one in an effective way, the way that the opposition is able to make change. And I have been looking for a kind of campaign that I think could accomplish this for a long time, and I found what I think could really work. And that's a, that's a campaign called Five for Palestine. Um, and you have cards, each of you with you, hopefully, um, that are about Five for Palestine. And basically what the, what the card um, talks about are five things that if everybody does them, could actually make a big difference. Now here's the thing. They're all very simple things. They're, they're intended to be done in addition to your other activism, not instead of it. But they're all very simple, and they don't work if one or two people do them. They work if everybody does them. And here are the five things. You can read them on your um, cards as well. Uh, first of all, to learn about the situation in Palestine, which you're doing here tonight, and you should continue to do, and probably have in the past too. Sign up by visiting fiveforpalestine.org. Read about it. If you agree, sign up, please. Um, contact, your, contact your elected representatives five times a year. You can do this very easily through the website. Um, obviously, it's even better to go there in person. Um, but, but basically, to do it along with all of your other, all of the other people in your constituency um, so that you're actually affecting, even with your letter writing, you're coming from one voice as opposed to fragments. Um, contribute $5 a month to the campaign. This is not a lot of money. This is less than a sandwich cost these days. Um, it's uh, basically if you have a couple hundred people in one area, in one constituency, um, giving $5 a month, you're, fine, you're actually able to open up a local office, have a local staff person, and build on that eventually state, state you know, 
lobby representatives basically um, going to Washington to actually lobby on your behalf. This is how other grassroots lobby organizations have been very effective. We can absolutely be as effective if we all do one thing in common, and I think this could work. Uh, the last thing is to get five family members, friends, or colleagues to join too. In a group like this, I'm sure you know five people who are also are sympathetic. Um, if you're young and have you know, are super or not young and have super are super into Facebook. Put it on your Facebook. You'll get people that way. Pretty easy. Um, it's actually a model built on that also that Obama has used to to mobilize people. Uh, basically, getting uh, a, a almost a consensus in the U.S. to actually function in an empowering and collective way. Um, Anyway, so there's one. So contacting elected um, officials, going to Palestine, educating ourselves and others. Other ideas? I just have a question of what TV stations have invited you to speak. Um, I'll answer that, but I just want to remind people this is not the Q&A part. We'll do that at the end. Oh, I'm um, sorry. But th that's okay. But yes, there have been, um, I mean, public access stations frequently invite me. Um, and as well, I've been invited by, uh, by local mainstream Stations, so Fox, ABC, NBC, if, if I'm in a particular city, let's say, so Fox in Rhode Island, I got to do an interview with them, that kind of thing. So, um, slowly, slowly. Um, I want to acknowledge you had had your hand up. Oh, you well, I had a, a question on a different... Yeah. So maybe we can do, I'll call, you'll be first in the Q&A. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, this is, is this about yeah, fashion about yeah. Is um, one of the most successful um, things used in the campaign against apartheid in South Africa was divestment, is strategic non-investment in the, and yes. Yeah. 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 So, That's the other one. Right, and I know that uh, right now there is a movement starting to divest from Israel. It's big and it's very exciting, yes. I mean, there, I, there's a zillion ways of getting involved, and I think we should do all what we're most passionate for. Um, but I have narrowed down the millions of opportunities to two that I think are the best effective at this point in the movement. And the, that other one is boycott divestment sanctions. It was extremely effective um, in international solidarity with black South Africans bringing down apartheid in South Africa. I think it can help bring down apartheid in Israel, Palestine as well. Um, and in fact, uh, the reason the international community did it in the case of South Africa was not because they were saving the South Africans. They were supporting them. Black South Africans asked for people to boycott and people supported them. Um, and that's exactly what Palestinian civil society has now asked of the international community. If for no other reason, we should be doing this because this is what Palestinians are asking for. It's nonviolent. It can work. And it's, it's, it's not asking much to say, basically, we are, we're, we're going to just take our money out <laughs> of, of this har these harmful things being done. So basically, you know, your, your church investments, your tuition dollars at universities, uh, your labor unions, your municipalities, you know, the municipalities here in Racine and Kenosha, the universities, where are those tuition dollars and where are those city dollars being invested? And are they profiting off of the occupation? Are they invested, invested in Israeli or US companies that are profiting off of this occupation? Do we want that money profiting off of this blood? Um, do we want that? Or do we want to shift our investments somewhere else? It's a, it's a again, a nonviolent, very effective way of showing solidarity and holding Israel accountable for its violations of international law. And although I believe we eventually will be effective in bringing this down um, uh, through, through U.S. government decisions with enough pressure, and I think we have an opportunity here that in an organized way we could pressure Obama and he would actually be more sympathetic towards making change than others in the past, um, but generally, the way change happens is that it starts at the grassroots. With South Africa, for example, the U.S. eventually stopped support, but it was after it had become completely unacceptable to keep supporting South Africa that they did it. So it was really led by that grassroots thing, and we need to continue to be strong in that way um, as we go. So here are, for example, just a few of the companies with a history of supporting Israel. This is just a few of them. I'm not going to linger on the slide because it's distracting. It's not important <laughs> that you that you boycott each and every one of those things. But is there a list that's available? Yes, ma'am. There is. It's on your handouts. There is a list on your handouts. There's a what, there's a um, 
a, uh, a website on your handouts okay. with a list of the different companies. But what I wanted to say, the reason I didn't linger there, is that the way boycott works is not that you each choose one little thing and you you know don't buy Kit Kat anymore or something like that. The way it works is that everybody chooses one thing in common, and that's what they focus their energies. When you think about uh, the civil rights movement, for example, and how change happened, was it like people wrote a letter, like a really really good letter and then they and they wrote another letter to their congressperson and then they wrote more you know no like people eventually were like the heck with the government we are going to take to the streets and we are going to step out of our homes in the comfort of our computers and our our lives and actually put ourselves out there and that's a scary thing to do um, and and sometimes there are risks but that's what change takes and I encourage people um, to do that to be ready to actually put themselves out there and maybe be unpopular, probably you'll find actually that it's the most fulfilling thing. I think I have the most fulfilling job in the world. It, it is also an exciting and rewarding thing to, to be active on these kinds of issues. And all of these ways of getting involved are ways of supporting what Palestinians are already doing, that Palestinians are not afraid to take to the streets. On the contrary, they're doing it every day in all different kinds of nonviolent demonstrations happening in the West Bank, as well as in Gaza and throughout historic Palestine and really around the world in Europe, etc. Um, and we hear, of course, what kind of resistance do we hear about in the US media from Palestinians? We hear about terrorism, we hear about rockets, about suicide yeah. bombs. These things do happen, but they are a they are less than one percent of the enormous amount of resistance that Palestinians are engaged in. The vast majority of Palestinians are not terrorists, they are not suicide bombers, they do not have weapons, they are everyday people and they're choosing to respond with extraordinary, too extraordinary violence with non-violent resistance. Things that are happening constantly that we are just not hearing about. Um, people taking to the streets, marching down the land that is being taken by the wall, um, singing freedom songs, holding sit-ins. Um, now Israel has recently adopted a strategy of hosing demonstrators. Um, that should that should be familiar to those of us who, uh, those of you who might have been involved in the civil rights movement. Um, uh, here's a group of Palestinian Christians in Bethlehem marching down to the checkpoint, separating them from their holy sites, asking, uh, "Why can't we also go to Jerusalem?" These are the kind of pictures we're not seeing in our papers, we're not hearing about, but it's nonviolent resistance, and it's everywhere in Palestine, uh, painting the wall. <laughs> Nonviolent resistance, right? Cultural things, celebrating Palestinian music, as well as Palestinian dancing, Palestinian art, culture, the embroidery I have out there on that table. I mean, the, the, the fact that in spite of being sort of, as they're standing there, erased from this land, from this area, to preserve that culture. Think about American Indians here in this country. Um, preserving their culture is about the biggest form of resistance, right? It's the same for Palestinians. It's nonviolent and it's everywhere. Um, that is nonviolent resistance. Okay. I think one of the um, most impressive ways of nonviolent resistance that, that I saw when I was there is people refusing to move. Um, farmers whose sheep, well, they're farmers now, but they were shepherds, their sheep were poisoned but they refused to leave their area. Now they're trying to farm. Um, a, a, a family that refused to, to leave their house, even though um, the settlers moved it all around them. They still refuse to move. I bet that's non-violent resistance. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Saying you can, you can take my freedom away, you can take my land, but you will not take my home. You will not take my dignity. You will not take my identity, my attachment, my 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 knowledge that I have rights, that I have a right to this land, that I am a human being. And these are kinds of, of probably the most basic and most uh, fundamental kind of resistance. And it is this extraordinary resilience that, frankly, is what gives me the most hope. Um, this is just another form of basically what to echo what you're saying that that everyday life becomes a kind of resistance. The students who wake up at 3.30 <coughs> or 4 in the morning, I'm not kidding, 3.30 in the morning, because they have to go through two checkpoints and a wall to get to school, but they still do it every single day, on their way there and on their way back, because they insist on getting education. 
You know, they refused to let the occupation prevent them from being educated, and in spite of everything, Palestinians remain some of the best educated people in the entire Middle East. You know, this is nonviolent resistance. And, and again, it's this resistance that we're not hearing about that is really the base of this entire movement. These are our leaders, and, and we need to take belief from them and, and hopefully be willing to make a tiny fraction of the sacrifices they're making every day, putting themselves out there. And I, I would, because I find it so inspiring, I'd like to end with a slideshow of photographs of Palestinians engaged in nonviolent resistance, um, every type from uh, you know, having a circus in a refugee camp to, to keep people's spirits high to uh, civil rights uh, st civil rights movement as this is of course another civil rights movement um, forms of resistance. And while it's playing, you'll hear a song sung by two Palestinian young women, uh, this girl Maisa and her older sister Shams. It's in Arabic. It's a, tra a traditional Palestinian folk tune to which the words have been changed to talk about uh, women's empowerment in the movement. So here it is. على دلعونا وعلى دلعونا وحنا سمعناكم وانتو سمعونا ولعبنا سوا وحنا أطفال ومشينا سوا بدرب النضال ضحنا سوا بالدم الغالي ضوينا العتم بنولي العيونا بدي تسمعني بالله يا خي مثل ما جابك خلفني باي حكايتنا حكاية للإنسانية حوا جابتنا وآدم أبونا انت بنت تسعة وانا بنت التسعة إلنا الاثنين الخلقات النابعة نوصلها سوا خامس وجمعة ولا نعطش احنا ولا تعطشونا على دلعونا وعلى دلعونا واحنا سمعناكم وانت سمعونا ولعبنا سوا واحنا اطفال ومشينا سوا بدرب النضال ضحنا سوا بالدم الغالي وضوينا العتم بنور العيون من وانا طفلك وانا بتألم نفسي اعتوق ونفسي اتعلم ووصل معاكم لا على السلم وأحقق ذاتي أحسن ما يكون أختي الكبيرة ربيت مقهورة جارتنا حبة تطلع دكتورة تفصد بالجيزة وهي صغيورة درب وتعليم وعيشة مهيورة على دلعونا وعلى دلعونا وحنا سمعناكم وانت سمعونا ولعبنا سوا وحنا أطفالي ومشينا سوا بدرب النضال ضحنا سوا بالدم الغالي وضوينا العتم بنور العيون ست الحنون بعز الحصيدة جرح بالقلب وجرح بالعيدة جوز عليها وطلقها سيدي ملقيت حماية ولا قانونة سيدي بهالزمن والله يا أختي أطلع الكران وصورة من ستي لا أرضى أنا ولا ترضي أنتي ولا يرضى حدا ولا يحزنونا على دلعونا وعلى دلعونا وإحنا سمعناكم وإنت سمعونا ولعبنا سوا وإحنا أطفالي ومشينا سوا بدرب النضال ضحينا سوا بالدم الغالي ضوينا العتم بنور العيون حقي اتعلم مهنة شريفة واختار شريكي ومن حقي اشغل اي وظيفة وحقوق المرأة لازم نصونا وحقوق المرأة حقوق الطفولة ضل القانون الضلة مدفونة مش عايز الضلة بقلبة مقفولة وهي تراح القرن العشرين على دلعونا وعلى دلعونا واحنا سمعناكم وانت سمعونا ولعبنا سوا واحنا اطفال ومشينا سوا بدرب النضال ضحنا سوا بالدم الغالي ضوينا العتم بنور العيون
Thank you very much. That's the end of the presentation. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> I was just going to say I'm excited about Q&A. I hope people don't leave immediately. Um, I did want to mention, um, especially if people are leaving now, a few of the things that are out there uh, on that table. Um, oh, what I, one thing I want to do before anything else, actually, is pass around an email list. People can also sign up online. This is um, if you'd like to get my reports when I'm in Palestine. Um, I guarantee it's not the kind of stuff you're going to get here in your local media. I don't send out much. Anyway, if you want to join, um, please print clearly. Otherwise, just pass it along. And I'll also let you know when I come back here to Wisconsin. Make sure you get one of these handouts. Um, here's a, um, this is the book that I have for sale out there that I wrote. It's called Witness in Palestine. A Jewish American Woman in the Occupied Territories. It's full of lots and lots of photographs and stories, um, almost full color. And uh, normally in bookstores it's about $28, but I'm selling it for $15 to $20 sliding scale here, whatever you want to pay in that range or even lower um, if, if need be. Um, so if you want one, get it here and I'll sign it for you happily. There are also DVDs. If you, there's anyone you wish had been here tonight, um, you can get a DVD of me giving basically this presentation. Uh, people are, are oftentimes showing it in their churches, in their schools, classrooms, etc., uh, to their communities. And I, I went over and got this little trinkets, little wristbands, three dollars or. Um, bumper stickers, maybe those are sold out. And then there's also pieces of embroidery, again, a really good way of supporting Palestinian women's cooperatives and, and communities that have lost everything, and this is a way for them to sustain themselves as well as supporting their, their families um, and communities. So um, please do consider stopping by there. Or uh, also a free will donation for Anna and her cause also. You don't have to. I don't, okay, well. <laughs> I won't, I guess I won't argue with <laughs> <laughs> um, And with that, I would love, sorry, you want to go, baby? There's a reception after, too. Oh, yay. Okay, oh. so actually, um, maybe I admit, forgot about the chronology. Shall we do the reception first and an informal Q&A, or shall we do a Q&A? Whatever you would like. Let's do, how about a few questions here, especially if people wanted the whole group to hear the answer, and then I'll be available as long as people stick around to answer um, any other questions. So you were going to ask the first question yeah, you've been um, waiting. Well, the only problem I have with the Palestinians is their government denies the right for Israel to exist. And they have denied the right for Israel to exist from the beginning, which is a very threatening position. And I guess would explain why Israel tried to expel a lot of the Palestinians in the beginning, because it just remains that way. And, and, and now their government, which seems crazy. I mean, you talk about these people who are very peaceful, but their government is nothing. It seems like they're doing nothing to um, organize their people, to stabilize the country. They're out there throwing rocks. I mean, it just seems primitive in view of the fact that there are things that they could do to ameliorate the situation. And I just don't have respect for um, their structure. And I don't know why people who are educated would would remain in that background and so um so yes this question of Israel's right to exist is has been around throughout the history of the conflict. Um, let's explore it a little bit. So um, imagine you're Palestinian. Um, here's the question about Israel's right to exist. Do you recognize for the the right for there to be a state on your historic homeland that explicitly excludes you? I, I agree with that basic tenet, but what can you do now? I mean, it, 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 had, it was decided, it was a bad decision, as far as I can tell. So what a lot of, what, what Palestinians initially, so Palestinian uh, national organizations have been around for a long time. Um, the first proposal, basically the main proposal that has been proposed by Palestinian, um, by Palestinian governments is, is that everyone in the area, 
live together as equal citizens of a democratic, secular state, namely one, one man, one woman, one vote, regardless of what their religion is. And as soon as Palestinians proposed that, they were demonized. Because if you propose one man, one woman, one vote, then you are against the existence of the state of Israel. You cannot have simultaneously a Jewish state and a state that respects everyone's uh, rights. And so this is the fundamental thing, and we tend to put the Jewish state first. Well, if you want a Jewish state and you want rights for Palestinians, I am sorry to be the one to tell you that you can't really have both. The reality of the demographics are that one is at the expense of another, and I don't think it's surprising at all when Palestinians don't recognize the right of something that requires them to give up their own human rights. Uh, to exist. Now that said, that doesn't mean that there is not an ability for everyone in the area's rights to be respected. Even if states don't have an inherent right, I don't think, to exist, human beings have rights, Israelis have rights, they all have a right to security, um, no matter what their religion is. And for example, a democratic state would actually open up the door to that. And that would mean putting democracy above the ethnic, um, the ethnic purity of Israel as only a Jewish state. And that's a scary idea for some, but it's something we, I think, need to have our minds open to. Um, Hamas is a relatively new phenomenon. Um, it is very clearly a response to um, decades and decades of um, oppression. It doesn't mean that everything they've done is good. In fact, I condemn any attacks on civilians, including, again, those, uh, I think it was about seven civilians of Israel who've been killed recently. But that in no way, in no way justifies any of what Israel's doing to collectively punish the entire population. Um, and, and, it, and Hamas, as well as other Palestinian organizations, has offered actually um, much more peaceful treaties. The only thing Israel has ever offered are things far from what Palestinian rights actually are. So we're not going to really see a resolution when the condition is, you need to gar guarantee us full security, guaranteed forever, and then we'll give you a little security. You're never going to get these that way. Yeah. Where would you come across with the actual Jewish homeland? Where would that be? Good question. All right. So Jewish homeland, I don't think there's any issue with having a Jewish homeland. Jewish state and Jewish homeland are different. That's what I'm asking. Where right. Is, where is the Jewish homeland? Well, officially, Israel is a Jewish state. Um, I suppose it would also define itself as the Jewish homeland, but I don't think those things have to come together. So um, I would, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm Jewish. I don't consider Israel my homeland. <laughs> um, I think that probably depends on the Jewish person. But one thing that people think about if Israel, for example, were to become the state of its citizens, if there was a democratic, secular state in the area, that part of the definition of that state could be the homeland of Palestinians and of Jewish people, and that's certainly a possibility and one that I think, uh, you know, I think the desire for a homeland is, is, a, is a founded and understandable one on the part of Jews, and that, and that, there can, that there's space for that in, in, the, uh, in the possibilities. Because I know I look at the, as a Christian, reading the Bible, it seems that they've been pushed every place that they, they go yeah. is situating a, a homeland, you might say, they're yeah. pushed out, including Bethlehem. Yeah. So, and that was before the Palestinians were there. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, actually, Palestinians are descendants of, uh, they've been there, many of them for thousands of years, so. They are also, I mean, genetically, Palestinians and, uh, and uh, Sephardic Jews and Israeli Jews, so the, the Jews who are certainly not, not through converts, but actually the indigenous people of the Middle East, they are closer in uh, DNA than either party is to Ashkenazi Jews like myself. So we're talking about a people who've been there often for thousands of years. So it's not that somehow Palestinians just came over and invaded. They're not foreigners, you know. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think- It's yeah, yeah. just trying to figure out is where in this sequence yeah, totally. Because all of a sudden the, the Jewish people were brought back, I call it brought back, right. to Israel. So the question, yeah, so the, the question is, um, what is the best, what is the best chance for Jewish people and for everyone else who have been expelled through, through the ages and all of the, the history of oppression and, and violence in this, in this world, what is the best chance for peace and coexistence? 
And so far, the, a lot of what our country and certainly what Israel has pursued is basically might equals right. The stronger we are, the, best, the better we can protect ourselves. And, and I don't think they can. That's where you see guerrilla tactics come up when you have that kind of scenario. Um, Israel is one of the least safe places for a Jewish people, person to be in the world. It is simply not able to be safe because of what it requires. So I think those are the questions to ask to talk about how we address the Jewish diaspora and that history. I, I'm so delighted that you have the DVD because when I talk to people at a dinner, well, we were all to dinner, a group of us, and I talked about this, and then what I said, you know, I said something about coming to one of these meetings, and one of one of my friends, she said, I know everything that I need to know, and so another friend said, well, tell us about it. She couldn't say anything. Mm -hmm. I mean, what is she going to say? There's some rockets that are flying in the air. And this is what they say, the rockets, mm -hmm. you know, and it's very frustrating. And this will say a whole lot because I get very frustrated and very angry. Yeah, the DVD is, is, um, is, is very good for people who don't know anything about it. Um, and people use it for that a lot. People put it on public access television. If anyone wants to volunteer to do that, I'll give you a free copy. You put it on type TV here. Um, yeah, it's really good in schools also for that reason. Yeah, I work in a school. So. Perfect, yeah. And if you know any other teachers, history teachers, anything, that's good. Other questions? Yeah? You kind of alluded to the fact that the, uh, the people that are there are closely related to one another. And I had been saying for quite a while, which I wasn't sure it was correct or not, that they were all descendants of Abraham. Oh, yeah. Children of Abraham. Wasn't it Muslims, Thomas, Christians, the children Jews. Of Abraham? Come on. They all fit on there. Yeah. I mean, to these theological arguments, first of all, you can go to ChristianZionism.org or to get sort of a deconstruction of the theological arguments used, arguments used, and yeah, children of Abraham, they all are. And, and would Jesus, Jesus really want for, for Jews to come to the chosen land to push off Christians and Muslims, I mean, really. We understand that Rome did force the Jews to leave right. Jerusalem many years ago. They told they were never to come back. But. <laughs> yeah. What is life like for a Palestinian and Arab and Muslim living in Israel? It, can that person vote? Uh, yeah, Palestinian citizens of Israel um, have certain rights within Israel. They have many rights. They have more rights than the other Palestinians under Israeli control in the occupied territories or in the diaspora, but they do not have full rights. They do not have the same rights as Jewish citizens of Israel. So, for example, uh, they can vote, they can run for office even. There are Palestinian citizens of Israel who are in office, but it's within a very limited structure. It's within a Zionist structure. So, for example, you can vote, you can run for office, but if you run for office on a platform that says, I want Israel to become the, the state of all of its citizens, uh, to represent not only Jewish people, but also me and my children and my people, then you're, you can be disqualified. Because if you are asking Israel to become a state of its citizens, you are not recognizing Israel's right to exist as a Jewish state. So it's, in a, it's within a Zionist framework, basically. More than 93% uh, of the land in the area is managed by the Jewish National Fund. Most of this land confiscated from the refugees. And that land is either extremely difficult or outright impossible for non-Jewish citizens to move on to. So they're very much ghettoized, even within their own state, really treated as foreigners in a place where they've been living for hundreds of thousands of years. Are there Palestinians in the Knesset? Yeah. If they if they recognize that it's not their if it, that's not uh, this, their own their state or their children's state. And appropriations of money from the government are very discriminatory between Jewish communities and Palestinian communities, oh, yeah. even if they're adjacent. That's as right. In, as in Nazareth. I mean, there's. I mean, I could read you a list of all the different ways or a, a portion of all the different ways that Palestinians do not have equal rights to Jews in, in, in the Jewish state. Yeah. yeah, I like your presentation, but uh, there was one thing uh, missing. Um, I am uh, a Muslim, born Muslim, but I don't practice. Yes. Uh, 
um, there has been, I am from the southern part of Pakistan. Yes. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Indus Civilization. Um, the book? No. Is it? The Sin province of Pakistan. Ah, okay. There has been migration. When Pakistan was created, there was migration from India to Muslims who migrated from India to Pakistan. And today we have uh, this um, uh, ethnic cleansing, mm -hmm. and uh, but uh, these uh, migrants to um, Pakistan, they uh, they come up and they say that uh, we want to live trade or educate the, the indigenous people. Mm -hmm. Same way I felt that your presentation was also uh, to educate only Palestinian. Why can why can um, the Israelis, the Jews, why didn't you thought that they need education too to this to the solution of the problem. Why there is uh Yes, I, I think I understand what you're saying, namely that um, it, it's important also for, for the, the people in the occupying country, Israel, to be educated and to be involved in working towards a solution on this issue. Is, because, that, is that fair? Because I think the problem uh, is not religious. Is right. the is the land for everybody? Right. Uh, even Palestinians were the indigenous people right. of the land. So uh, why not educate Israel, the Jew uh, uh, community, or the Jews? Uh, okay. Uh, first of all, I in no way meant to if I did. I certainly do not believe that it's my place to educate Palestinians. I mean, Palestinians, as I said, are really the leaders on this issue, and they are my teachers, not the opposite. And maybe I didn't make that clear. Um, the Palestinians are extremely well educated. They're an extremely capable population. A very dangerous uh, tendency is for people, especially from a Western country like ours, to go in and think, well, Palestinians just don't know how to help themselves. Here, I'm going to educate them. I'm going to teach them about nonviolence. I'm going to teach them about, um, about what it means to coexist, to respect. You know, Palestinians have all of these values. They are extremely capable of doing all of these things. They need our support. It is hard to maintain things when your nonviolent resistance leaders are systematically imprisoned. It's not they don't have these traditions, we have to support them. So if that was in any way clear, I, I do want to clarify about that. In terms of educating the Israeli population, absolutely. Um, Israelis should know what's happening, and I believe should speak out, and many of them are. Um, I think what you'll find in Israel, as you'll find in any country, um, where people are profiting off the system, even if they ideologically or ide ideally maybe um, oppose the, the, uh, the you know, immoral actions their government might do, they're not necessarily putting their lives on hold and committing themselves completely to um, changing it. Just like here in the U.S., the majority of the people can be against the war in Iraq, uh, but we still, you know, Bush was still re-elected in 2004. You know, probably, and and then now even with Obama, it continues and will for a while. So um, I think a danger that we have is to sort of rely on the population um, that is part of the uh, occupying power uh, to make that change. And Martin Luther King said, it's a great quote, I repeat it almost every time, freedom is never voluntarily given by the oppressor, it must be demanded by the oppressed. The, the people who are profiting off of it however good they might be, are not going to lead the movement to change. Well, they are going to follow it. But the things which are uh, occurring... Can I, let, let me interrupt you because I think people are getting... Let's continue this conversation outside um, at the reception. Um, you and I can keep talking now and I want to hear anyone else's questions and also I'll be there signing books. Um, and thank you everyone for being here if you do have any questions. It started in the streets.
It started in the streets, not an institution, not an institution to write a constitution. Who wrote any constitution that stagnated waves of revolution and complete eternal change? Who wrote this constitution? And do we know the meaning of the constitution, my brother? What does a constitution constitute to you? To me, black man was it written for them or the brother who was made to rule the other? It started in the streets. It started in the streets, not in institutions, not in institutions, not in the hospitals, bug houses, and beat up squads, where heavy shadows of death hang over a prison.